Welcome everyone to our second forum for fall 2020, Coming Out of the Closet, Personal Stories of Pursuing One's Authentic Self, with guest speakers, Christy Brazil, Dane Whitaker, Linda Burney, and Denny Mangers, telling their personal stories of overcoming family, religious, and societal attitudes to come to terms with their authentic selves. Before we begin, please note that this Zoom webinar is a bit different from Zoom meetings you may, may be familiar with. Your audio will stay muted and you won't be able to see yourself, only the speakers. Chat has been disabled. Please use the Q&A if you have questions. The speakers will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So now let me turn it over to Christy Brazil who will introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Chip. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad to be here with you to share our stories of coming out. In keeping with the Renaissance Society value of learning, our panel wanted to share a few ideas with you first that are a baseline to our talk. Living authentically. Scientists do not know the exact cause of sexual orientation, but they theorize that it is caused by a complex interplay of genetic, hormonal, and environment influences and do not view it as a choice. While some people believe that same-sex attraction is unnatural, scientific research shows that these relationships are a normal and natural variation in human sexuality and are not in and of themselves a source of negative psychological effects. There is insufficient evidence to support the use of psychological interventions to change sexual orientation. Many gay and lesbian people are in committed same-sex relationships, though only in the 2010s have census forms and political conditions facilitated their visibility and enumeration. These relationships are equivalent to heterosexual relationships in essential psychological respects. There is a small portion of the population whose gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. These individuals are considered transgender or gender non-conforming. They may choose to undergo social and or physical gender transition to align their gender with their internal sense of self. Our panel today includes Dennis Mangers, Linda Berner, Dr. Dane Winokur, and myself, Christy Brazil. And first, we're going to start with Dane, Dennis Mangers telling his story. Dennis? He must have got kicked out. Maybe we'll go to the next speaker. Well, then why don't we go to Dane? Dane, would you mind starting for us here, please? Hi there. Can you all hear me OK? Yes. All right, great. Sorry for the technical difficulties. But I'll go ahead and tell you my story. Thank you all for being here this afternoon and for joining us to hear our stories. Um, it's really exciting for me to be able to tell this story of my transition. So my name is Dr. Dane Whitaker and I am, my pronouns are he, him and his. And I identify first as a transgender man and secondly as a transgender veterinarian. So I am often asked to talk to forms such as this about diversity, equity, inclusion, and to tell my story. And it's very exciting for me to be here today to talk to you all. I'm used to talking to groups of veterinarians, so it's great to be here. And for that reason, I am often asked to, to discuss these issues. I'm the president of Pride VMC. This, we are the national LGBTQ plus vet group. So we provide education and advocacy for queer identified members of the uh, veterinary profession. So basically what I'd like to do is tell you my story so that hopefully you can get some perspective on what it was like for someone like me to go through transition, to, to come to that decision, and for you to be able to see the importance and the, the ease with which you can acknowledge someone's true self and allow them to live authentically. So before I launch into my story, I do want to address a question that I'm often asked, and that is, why 
is this seemingly straight white guy here to talk to us about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why should we listen to his story? And I'll tell you why. It's because I have privilege and because that privilege gives me responsibility. What do I mean by that? Well, I spent the first 40 years of my life in a female body with a masculine presentation. So my outside presentation didn't match what I felt inside. I lacked gender privilege. So every time I had to go to use a public restroom, I had to think about what someone might do or say, or even if I would come to physical harm because of the way I look. Then I transitioned. I gained gender privilege. Now my outside presentation matches what I feel inside. That perspective of not having privilege and then gaining it gave me tremendous insight into how much responsibility comes with that. Not having to worry about what someone might do or say because of the way I look, that is privilege. Not having to worry about sending your kid to the corner store after dark to buy milk because of the color of their skin, that is privilege. And that privilege gives all of us the responsibility to stick up for, to stand up for, and to fight for the rights of folks that do not have the same privileges that we do. So that is why I'm here to tell you my story. So, as I said earlier, I identify as a transgender man. And that transition the decision to transition was not an easy one. It is definitely something that I thought about and angsted over and really spent a lot of time and a lot of time in therapy discussing it. And I realized that everybody's journey is different. And it was my journey to step into. So that opened the door for me to, to go ahead and make the decision to transition. And when I did finally come to that decision, in my mind, there were three things that needed to happen to give me the green light to go ahead. And the first thing was I needed to come out to my family, right? This is a big thing that many trans folks face. I'd already come out once as a lesbian. Now I had to come out again as transgendered. It seemed a little unfair, but so be it. And I'm gonna tell you a story about this period of time in my life, and it hopefully will illustrate for you how important it is to see someone for who they authentically are and to allow them to step into that authenticity. So around this time in my life, I was participating in a fellowship at UC Davis for veterinarians to go back to, um, to study a topic of their choice. And during the fellowship, I was writing a blog. And in the blog, I identified as male. I was trying it on to see how it felt. And I knew I was going back to visit my parents back East and I knew that this was gonna be the time that I needed to talk to them about my transition. And I was anxious, you know, there was a lot of anxiety inside about this. And I got off the plane and I climbed into the car next to my dad and he turned to me and said, by the way, we read your blog would you like us to call you our son? And with that one simple eloquent question, I realized that my 80 year old parents got it. They saw who I was and the weight of the world just lifted from my shoulders. I knew that they could accept me being my authentic self. So if my 80 year old parents could get it so eloquently and so easily, I knew that there was hope for the rest of the world and that I could do this. The second thing that needed to happen for me to get the green light in my own mind was I needed to come out to my clients and my coworkers. And this is a huge thing that many trans folks, many of us deal with because a lot of us decide to transition in the middle of our lives. And so this is a big deal, right? You have to figure out how do I do this in the midst of my career? Well, again, around the same time, I'm gonna tell you another story about, about coming out as transgender to my coworkers. I was participating in this, uh, in this fellowship in order to decide whether or not I wanted to go back to school to pursue a residency in small animal medicine. 
And my coworkers knew this. Uh, so I'd come back to the practice after being away for a month and I said, okay, everyone, I have an announcement to make. And they all turned to me with very worried expressions on their faces. And, and they were more concerned that I was gonna tell them that I was leaving the practice than what I actually told them, which is I'm transitioning. So again, another aha moment where it just, the, the anxiety lifted. And as far as my clients were concerned, I, um, I wrote a letter to my most active clients explaining the pronoun change, the gender change, the name change, and I invited them to be part of it and to participate and to, to ask questions so that um, I was met with nothing but acceptance and open-heartedness and congratulations, again, letting me be my authentic self. So the second barrier to my transition had fallen away. Thirdly, I needed to come out to my partner. And I had at that time met the love of my life to whom I'm still married. And she was completely on board with things. And so I started my FTM transition in 2006 at the age of 41. So that's my story. I hope that by listening to it, you all can gain some insight into how easy and important it is to see someone for who they authentically are and to accept them and allow them to step into that authenticity. Before I leave you this afternoon, I do want to stress one thing about this story. And that is, this is a happy story. And it's full of love and compassion and open-heartedness. And I want to acknowledge that that is not true for all of us. There are many of my trans brothers and sisters who have lost their jobs, their families, and even their lives for their decision to pursue their authenticity. And when I first started telling this story, I was hesitant because I didn't want everyone to think I had on rose colored glasses and because it is a happy story. And then I realized that's exactly why I need to tell it. If I can reach one parent out there who's struggling with a trans kid, or one teacher who has a trans student, or just someone who's trying to figure out how to be their authentic self, then I've accomplished what I set out to do, which is to spread the word that we can do this. If we treat each other with compassion and open-heartedness and acceptance, and allow each and every one of us to step into that authenticity, then we can have a happier world. So thank you all for listening to my story. Hopefully we've figured out all the technical issues and uh, I, I'm not exactly sure who I'm gonna turn it over to next because I wasn't yeah, paying attention. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go to Linda, Dane. All right, sounds good. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda and thank you all for listening and happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Dane. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Burnham. I was raised on the Lake Erie shore in the woods of Timberlake, Ohio. I played baseball with the neighborhood boys, built tree forts, loved exploring the woods, looking for arrowheads. I spent the summertime playing on the docks, sailing, watching my dad work on our boat and join the boys for ice hockey and snow sledding in the winter. I didn't spend much time with my two little sisters. I liked playing with the boys so much better than girls. I would try to play with the village girls if they liked to play in the woods or at the lake. But when they brought out their dolls, I was out of there. I would sometimes patiently wait for them to finish so we could go play hide and seek or ride our bikes around the village. My father got a job as an aeronautical engineer at Aerojet. My mom, sisters, and I moved to Sacramento on the California Zephyr train in the early 1960s to join him. I remember my mom made a comment on the train about seeing a woman that looked dykey. For some reason, that little comment stayed with me. I'm not sure I even knew what dykey meant, 
But as a child, I heard an inflection and in tone, and I knew that it was something bad. I clearly recall while traveling on the train, I made a conscious decision that when I got to high school in Sacramento, I was going to start acting like a girl and I'm carrying a purse. Yuck. It didn't last long. I wasn't aware I was attracted to my best girlfriend in high school until much later in life. Looking back, I was attracted to several girls. I started dating boys in my senior year. I never felt like I cared very deeply for any of them, but I did enjoy the sports car rallies and racing that they also liked. I went to Sac State studying psychology, communications, and journalism. I developed some wonderful lifelong friends with both men and women in school. I hadn't thought about gay people, nor did I think I knew any. The gay movement just didn't resonate with me. I didn't pay any attention to it. I later realized I had some very strong feelings for some of my women friends. I just never acknowledged it to myself, much less them. So I had one straight girlfriend, Willie, who had a boyfriend. And the three of us took a trip to Mendocino. I was secretly in love with her, but I didn't know it and I was just going nuts. While the three of us were exploring Mendocino, I remember thinking, why does he have to be here? Siren should have been going off in my head, but that's where my self recognition stopped. I started taking a communications class from a woman professor at Sac State. We became close friends, walking our dogs, sailing, and double dating two male veterinarians from the clinic I lived in and I worked in as I went through college. The two of us took a road trip to Mexico and I secretly felt attracted to her, but never said anything or acted on it in any way. When we came home, we stopped at the Berkeley Marina to go sailing with the boys. On our way home to Sacramento, she gently rested her hand on my leg. Uh, it was like fireworks went off in my body. I was freaking out because I was so overwhelmed with feelings, questions, butterflies in my stomach, while at the same time trying to drive home. I asked her why she double dated with me all those times. And she said it was her best way to spend time with me. I was very excited and terrified at the same time because she had asked me to stay the night with her. She finally told me she had been a lesbian for years but I never picked up on it. We got to her condo and she asked me if I wanted to come in and have a bourbon. And, and I hate bourbon, but I was still freaking out. So I said, yes. We were sitting on the couch next to each other. And I asked her why she never told me she was a lesbian. Instead of answering me, she kissed me. At that exact instant, I was finally fully aware I too liked women, much more than men. So I knew at that moment I was a lesbian. As our relationship evolved, it was clearly the first intimate relationship I had ever had filled with enlightenment, love, respect, truth, communications, thoughtfulness, softness, kindness, and lots of laughter like I've never experienced before. I went to the Women's Center on campus and joined a lesbian support group. I began to notice other women that I was attracted to and be began dating. 
sometimes I approached them, mm -hmm. but I was pretty shy and usually waited for them to ask me out. But it, was, it always felt like the right thing for me. I became a political activist for the women's movement and gay issues. When The Advocate, a national lesbian gay news magazine, did an article on the Sacramento gay activist scene in the Capitol, I was quoted as saying, Sacramento needed a gay and lesbian voice to pull us together and to fight for our rights and help increase gay and lesbian self-esteem and to educate the straight community about us. Not long after that interview, State Senator John Briggs wrote an initiative from the 1978 ballot, Proposition 6, designed to fire all lesbian and gay educational workers. I knew we needed to get the word out and stop this oppressive legislation from passing. Even though I studied journalism in college, I really didn't know much about the newspaper business, but I felt so strongly about this assault on the gay community that I invited friends to my home one evening for a brainstorming session about naming the newspaper. We landed on calling it Mom Guess What Newspaper. Based on the classic conversation most gay and lesbians say to their parents, but especially their moms, when coming out to them. I contacted advertisers, investors, writers, envelope stuffers, and we started the newspaper. Our first focus on the importance of voting was no on Proposition 6. That issue hit the streets on October 1st, 1978. Soon, in November, the proposition was defeated. We like to think we made a difference with the campaign. It was official. We had started the first legitimate gay newspaper in Northern California. Early on, I reached out to C.K. McClatchy, the owner of the Sacramento Bee to mentor me because I wanted to model the paper after the Sacramento Bee. He was a very closeted gay man, not publicly out until after his death. He initially rejected all my requests out of fear of being associated with anything gay and to be seen with me. But I wanted to learn from the best and my persistence wore him down and he finally agreed. He offered priceless guidance in helping me create a quality newspaper for the gay, lesbian, and the straight readership. Plus, we became close friends up until his death. I was always very careful never to out him. I was one of very few people who knew he was gay. For the next 30 years, our newspaper successfully supported the gay community and also offered educational insights for the straight community that gay people are just like all other people with the same dreams, hopes, and desire to love. With the help and inspiration of MGW, the gay community started many different support organizations like Gay Fathers, Gay Games, which was like at the Olympics, Square Dancing, Sacramento Men's Chorus, Kayaking Club, Political Clubs, River City Business Association, Softball Associations, Lesbian Cancer Support Groups, Dining Out Groups, and many, many AIDS Support Groups and Associations. The newspaper also provided me an entry point with the Sacramento Police Department to partner and advise them on a variety of gay issues, sitting on advisory panels, teaching new recruits, and many times going on ride-alongs when there were gay issues. The more visibility I got as a publisher of a new gay newspaper, the more I was at risk 
of being harmed by people who don't understand who we are. I was contacted by the police chief at the time, Chief Arturo Venegas, that I was on a hit list. He provided me around the clock police protection until the threat passed. For someone like me that I thought I didn't know any gay people, much less didn't have a clue that I was gay, I had a remarkable and full life, st still filled with love and laughter and meaningful relationships that all LGBTQ people seek, allowing me to truly live my authentic life. Thank you so much for listening to my story. And now I'm going to pass it on to Dennis Mangers to tell his story. I'm really honored to speak with you today. Mine is not a story that can be adequately told in 10 minutes. So today you're only gonna get the highlights and it will either be enough to serve the curiosity that brought you to this session or it will cause you to wanna to learn more about this very common but still very controversial aspect of the human experience. Born in 1940, my childhood was pretty unremarkable. I was the first of three sons born to a loving couple, both of whom were smart but not college educated. My father had played football, became a pretty good boxer in his days with the Civilian Conservation Corps, and was a serious bodybuilder. He and my mom had pretty obvious ideas about their duties as parents to teach their three sons how to become real men. So we were schooled in boxing for self-defense and sometimes for sibling dispute resolution. And we were taught to view football as the only sport of any real significance. I can't remember ever hearing the words homosexual or gay during my childhood, nor do I recall ever having my masculinity questioned per se. But one of my brothers still believes that my early interest in music, theater, dance, and student government should have been an early clue as to my orientation. Go figure. When I arrived in eighth grade and brought home an announcement of the first formal dance, my parents were a little over the top in their insistence that I invite a girl to that event. Well, I liked to dance, and I enjoyed the attention of the company of girls in my classes, so that came easily, and I continued to ask girls to various school and other social events over the next several years. It was around my junior year of high school that I remember transitioning from being expected to ask girls to events to actually wanting to. I was buoyed by the fact that they seemed equally or sometimes even more interested in me, and I began having girlfriends with whom I engaged in the typical mutual exploration commonly referred to in those days as petting. In my second year of college, I was elected student body president, and I began dating our homecoming queen, whom I ultimately married after graduating three years later when we both turned 21. I loved my beautiful wife, and I loved the intimacy of our relationship, and we soon produced a beautiful daughter as I was just completing my service uh, in the United States Navy. Well, here's the hard part that people have a lot of trouble understanding, and I must add, so do I. Unlike most gay men who typically report that they knew from childhood that they were somehow different, the thought that I might be gay never occurred to me until I turned 36 and was elected to the California State Legislature. It was a long shot for me to be elected to the State Assembly as a Democrat from Orange County. And we were unprepared to face the reality that if I were elected, I would be living in Sacramento four days and three nights a week for eight months of the year. It was very difficult being apart from my family and seeing them only on the weekends. But it was to become even more challenging than I could have possibly imagined in the months ahead. Having been identified as a singer and a longtime supporter of the arts, I started being invited to arts-related events and parties on the weeknights that I was in the Capitol. Arts leaders, many of whom are openly gay, lobbied me to become an ally in their constant quest for funding, and so did many others, including LGBT advocates from my district and around the state seeking votes for progressive legislation that was emerging at that time. On one such occasion, the then head of the California Arts Council and his young new deputy came to lobby me on a bill of interest to them. 
Later that evening, he called and asked if I would like to join him for a drink after session, and I agreed. After the second drink, he boldly asked me if anyone had ever told me they thought I might be gay. And I responded probably rather too quickly and forcefully that indeed, no, they had not. And I asked him why he had suggested such a possibility, and he said that during our meeting that afternoon, I seemed totally preoccupied with his handsome young deputy rather than he, who had done most of the talking. And furthermore, he asserted, gay men in the Capitol claimed that my appearance there had set off their so-called gay dark. That night, as I lay in bed alone, this undiplomatic observation, and as it turns out, quite self-serving remark from the state's art czar, started a cascade of distant memories that I tried desperately to block. But the Pandora's box that is our subconscious was ruthless in confronting me with never realized feelings of attraction and even love for men from my past. Coaches, teachers, fellow performers, that chaplain's assistant in the Navy, and countless others emerged from what must have been deeply and successfully repressed memories. This very successful repression, it turns out, is not totally uncommon among those of us from that or earlier times when the environment seemed too unsafe for such thoughts to surface. Over the next several weeks, the dam broke entirely, and it became both a daily and nightly deluge of memories that could not be dismissed. And so it was that one evening, weeks later, while back in my district, I went to the home of my longtime accompanist, ostensibly to rehearse for a holiday concert for my constituents. My accompanist was openly gay and very good looking, and he had sent furtive signals that he found me attractive. During a break with a glass of wine, I found myself bearing my very troubled soul to him, and he put his hand over on my shoulder. I took it as an empathetic gesture, but when he did, I impulsively reached over and kissed him. The scene progressed, and when I returned to the Capitol the next morning, I knew my life would never be the same. Long story longer, I was either so intrigued or so in denial or both at this turn of events, I started having meaningless affairs with women while beginning to engage in what I thought were discreet liaisons with various men. I enjoyed both, despite the logistic complications, and there were many, and I soon came to think I must be bisexual or maybe even pansexual. But increasingly, I began to feel not only a greater attraction to men, but a hunger for a deeper emotional connection as well. So deep that in 1980, when I narrowly lost my bid for a third term, I had begun to believe that I was, in fact, intrinsically gay. And I started for the first time to think of how I could possibly shift my life at age 40 plus into living openly and authentically in the fullness of who I really was. I rehearsed how I would broach this epiphany to my wife and still young children. Believing I could never live openly in my former role as a school administrator, I accepted the position of chief lobbyist of the then nascent cable TV industry, hoping that when I felt comfortable coming out, I would have established myself as invaluable and safe. But during the first year, a colleague, a former colleague, went to the association president and told him that there were rumors in the Capitol that I was gay and becoming an activist. He hoped apparently that I would be fired and he could assume my position. When summoned into the office of the president one morning and hearing of this so-called rumor, it's hard to even tell you how terrified I was that I might be losing my job and be unable to support my wife and children. I told my new boss that it was true on both counts. I had come to believe that I was gay and would inevitably activate on behalf of equal rights. To my astonishment and great relief, he said something like, welcome to the entertainment industry. Your orientation is personal and irrelevant. We became great friends over the succeeding years and still are to this very day. But months later, the second shoe dropped. I was invited to a celebration of gay pride in LA and after the parade, joined others in the outdoor dancing. At some point, the young son of a family very close to mine from my district spotted me and came up tapping me on the shoulder said, well, hello, Assemblyman. It looks like we have a little secret. 
I told him that I wasn't yet certain of my own reality and suggested we keep this encounter mutually confidential. But after assuring me that he would do so, he jumped in his car, drove to Huntington Beach, and told my 16-year-old daughter that he had caught me dancing shirtless at a gay event. So now outed twice within months, I went home and had the painful and difficult conversations that were necessary to explore a new life while maintaining the precious relationship with a wife and children I could not bear to lose. The new life meant learning to navigate a centuries old culture, brand new to me, a culture that brought elements of stigma and discrimination foreign to my former straight white male privilege. As I said at the top of the story, it can't be told in 10 minutes, so just let me wrap it up like this. I stayed with the cable industry for 27 years, succeeding that boss as president. I went on to serve then Senate President Steinberg as his strategic advisor, and now I serve Mayor Steinberg as his advisor for arts and culture. My beloved wife and I eventually found a path to lifelong friendship, and when she died of Alzheimer's two years ago this week, I held her in my arms at the end. My daughter and son, now 56 and 49, are very close to me, as are my grandchildren, 30 and 28, an attorney and history teacher, respectively, who cannot believe my gayness was ever an issue. All of them adore my husband of 28 years, Michael, as I do. For more details, uh, ask me questions at the end, or you can read my forthcoming book. Thanks very much for listening. Now I think it must be to, back to Christy. That's right, Denny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denny, and everyone else that went before me. I'm honored and humbled to share this virtual stage with my friends who, who've had such remarkable journeys. My story shares some similarities with all of them, but with one major shift in that my awareness culminated after a lifelong unfoldment at the ripe age of 65. Because I spent much of my life at varying levels of denial, only in retrospect have I been able to recognize the moments and milestones that brought me full journey. But I'm willing to be fully vulnerable and share that journey with you today. In full transparency, which I find stunningly parallel to my coming out, is that I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm blessed now with over 30 years in recovery, but what I now understand is that coming to terms with my sexual orientation had many of the same alcoholic type denials, rationalizations, shame, secretive behaviors, and thinking, justifications, and normalcy definitions and beliefs that kept me drinking far too long. For me, the sexual orientation process all started with confusion. As a young girl, that confusion surfaced simply as not understanding why I had the attractions I had toward other girls. As a teenager, adding to all the other pubescent confusions that come with that passage, I was noticing my attraction from time to time to other girls. I knew those feelings simply had to be repressed and denied. Not all girls, not many of them actually, just one now and then, but I knew to reject those fantasies. How did I know that? Because cultural and societal messaging is designed to subtly teach us. We learn it in church, during school, through childhood friendships, by family comments or conversations overheard, on TV and in the movies. Just like the song in South Pacific about racism, we have to be carefully taught. All the while, realizing we are being carefully taught the rules for behaviors and attractions. Plus, our society is so fearful of our own sexuality, we're not good at all of teaching how to understand or experience or consider its many aspects. Entering puberty, I found myself fantasizing about having a boyfriend, or at least, you know, being attractive to boys. I was also abundantly aware of the ultimate cultural and societal expectation to get married to a man and have a family of my own. Once in high school, dating eluded me until my senior year when I finally had a steady boyfriend, 
that provided me those opportunities to explore those first kisses and necking and petting, but not much more than that. Still in high school, those occasional attractions to other girls popped up, but I shoved them back down again. My biggest aha moment should have arrived when I was asked to babysit during high school. After the two little girls had gone to bed, I was digging around in the magazines in the living room and I found some playboys buried at the bottom of the pile. We didn't have those magazines at my house, or at least I'd never found them. I remember flipping through the pages and being surprised how noticeably aroused I was by the pictures of the beautiful women. I slapped the magazine closed and quickly returned it to the bottom of the pile. Denied! But I can assure you, the next time I went to babysit for that couple, I sought out those magazines. Of course, I responded the same way again, suppressed. I simply didn't know why or what to do with those feelings. Then, off to college and new experiences. In my freshman year, I was infatuated with another girl on my dorm floor, and I got an invite to go home with her for Easter break. We were sleeping in her double bed one night, and I had this urge to just put my arm around her, but I knew that was not going to be welcomed, and fear stopped me. Repressed. College went on. I was introduced to a man, and we began to date. By my junior year, we were engaged, we got married that summer, and we started married life together. I finished college, we bought our first house, everything was right on track, you know, according to the expectations of the world I understood. Again, in hindsight, I realized that marriage was a marriage of convenience far more than any great classic love story. Once married, my drinking escalated and offered the perfect escape for any and all feelings of discomfort. By the time I finally came to terms with my glaring alcoholism, I was long divorced. My recovery from alcoholism became my prime directive and full focus. I was committed and willing to do the deep and wide introspective work required to keep my new gift of sobriety. And my spiritual advisor said years later, Christy, we just don't know what we don't know, and we won't until we're ready. I dabbled in dating men from time to time, but it always felt like my standards must be way too high because I just couldn't find anyone worth investing time in. It turns out my standards were the issue, but in a whole different way. I had good jobs, a great group of friends, and my life went on. I did have the occasional desire to have someone special to share my life with in a relationship, but I was willing to let the universe unfold in its own time. Though I'd planned my work retirement exit strategy carefully, we all know that life happens. And I was forced to exit my dream career five years early after a layoff. Eventually, I determined retirement was not as elusive as I feared, and I made the leap. Once retired, I finally identified my strongest motivation to staying closeted all those years was my fear of loss of employment. But once I was retired, all bets were off. Feeling particularly free to explore a relationship, I not only admitted I still sought that special someone, I decided to test my sexual orientation landscape. I started reading some different books. I joined a meetup group of women who called themselves late bloomers, and we'd get together for coffee and talk about our journey and wonderings about what it meant to live as a lesbian. How do you find someone to begin dating? How do you date? What's it like to have intimate relations with another woman? These were women, many who had been married, raised a family, but now also finally felt free to explore something they always felt had been somewhat, somehow hidden away in them. I introduced myself as bisexual, thinking that might be my definition. That definition also felt like it had a safe transitional aura about it. I could still hang on to the possibility of being, you know, one half normal because I was still driven by a bit of fear and that sense of stepping out into such an unknown territory. I still didn't know the consequences. But just like when I came to terms with my drinking, the fear of going forward was so much less than the fear of hanging back any longer. I felt confident to start telling my truth to some select and very close friends. Those conversations went better than I expected. 
These friends lovingly received and even celebrated my news. I sought out a support group for people new to coming out. I talked to some gay women friends and explored my thinking and feelings more. One conversation in particular was enlightening. I announced quite proudly I was pretty sure I was bisexual. My friend, who has known me for years, said, I should probably take a look at that a little closer. She referenced some experiences she knew of, and when we finished the talk, I confirmed, yeah, I'm a lesbian. I returned to the women's meetup group one evening for dinner and shared with the other women that I'd come to realize I wasn't really bisexual, but a lesbian. One of the women jokingly said, ah, yes, bisexuality, the gateway drug to lesbianism. Coming out to my family was my last hurdle. My father passed before my full awareness and my mother suffered from dementia toward her end, but I was certain she had some very strong religious convictions against my new lifestyle, so I never said a word. On the day of my mother's funeral, after we'd all gotten back home, I chose to tell my brothers and sisters about my new life and relationship. Once again, I was pleasantly overwhelmed and surprised by their complete and total acceptance and happiness for me. That was not at all what I expected, but so very welcome. And I felt a proverbial exhale for the first time in a long time. My best gift was to find someone early on in my dating that was a great match. And I've been catapulted into another dimension of experiences and feelings I never knew possible. This tender, loving relationship has helped me solidify that I am now finally awakened and committed to my authentic self. In closing, I feel compelled to share that the process of preparing for this forum presentation has been a real roller coaster ride for me. I've had a number of doubts and fears about being so open and trusting. Thanks to help from these very friends you've heard today, I stayed the course with the focus of a learning opportunity for you who might want to look inside the heart and mind of someone like me. Because I'm certain you may have children or grandchildren or other family or friends that have gone through or are going to go through this same kind of thing. As the lifelong learners we are, we recognize that knowledge is power and hopefully you might be better prepared and empowered to understand what they are experiencing. Thank you for your kind attention. And now I think we're going to open it up for questions in these last few moments. So if all of my fellows would turn on their audio and their video, we can find out what kind of questions we have for this last 10 minutes or so. Bob? Okay. Uh, I think the first question is uh, for Dane here. It's, uh, do you think it's easier for trans kids these days than when you went through your transition? And if so, what else would you like to see done to make it even easier? Yeah, th that's a great question. And I think that, yes, it is definitely easier from the standpoint that there are external things that are available for kids today that weren't available to folks like me, you know, 12, 13 years ago. So I don't think it's necessarily easier from an internal standpoint. I think we all probably go through the same, um, the same angst and the same, the same decision-making processes. I think that's, like I said in my story, I think it's, it's different for each of us. Uh, but I do think that there are more resources available. I think that society is more accepting as a whole, particularly <laughs> younger folks. I think older folks in society probably have a little bit of, of catching up to do, but I do think that, you know, as these resources become more available and people become more educated, it, it does become easier. And I think that what I would like to see to make it even easier or better is to have people treat each other with compassion and open-heartedness and to always come back to that. And I, I think that that's maybe a little bit harder to, to get everyone to adhere to. But I think the more folks like me that tell our stories and like the rest of us here, the greater opportunity we will have to make it easier for everyone. Okay, uh, another question here is for Linda. Uh, could uh, you expound a little bit about the effect the paper had on young people who had been thrown out of the house when they came out? Oh, that's a very good question. I um, have 
many experiences with that. Um, uh, being pretty much the only game in town, being the gay newspaper, there was no place for gay people to go, you know, to, to talk to any, anyone or a therapist type or counselors. So anyhow, kids would come into my office and they'd be 10, 11, 12, maybe 15 years old and I wanted to talk and they'd come to our front counter and some of my staff would talk to them. But a lot of times um, my staff would invite them into my, uh, my office because I had a sofa in there and we could relax, they could relax more and talk to us. And, but, um, and, and a lot of them, their parents had thrown them out because they mentioned <laughs> they gay. Uh, they, uh, they just didn't have any place to go. And so a couple, couple of these kids I took home with me and they stayed with me for four or five days until I could find a place for them to be. But now it's really different because we have a gay and lesbian center here in Sacramento. Most cities do. Um, our, uh, we hopefully, the street community is much more educated about the gay community and hopefully families aren't reacting like that too much. Um, and there are some programs that the gay, uh, the gay Center here in Sacramento has started where there's a, a home building uh, for young people to stay at until they can sort things out and get an apartment or a job or, you know, just depending on what their age is. Thank you. Okay. Uh I have one more question here. There's certainly a lot of comments thanking uh, all of you for your presentation. Uh, uh, so I'll pass those on to everybody. Um, let me see. There's another question here. If I can find it. Uh, Bob, I'll take one of these questions. I, okay. I think someone's asking how to help a friend understand how yeah. to support her child's journey. Among those support groups that are available that Linda suggested, there's one called P Flag, which is I'm sure easily searchable online, and it's an organization of a family that are supporting their equivalent family members for for this journey on this journey. So it it would be my suggestion to investigate them and see what they have to offer. I'm sure there's a lot of good resources that they can provide for somebody that's struggling that way. Okay, they have one last question here since it's just about uh, time is up. Uh, what is Denny, when is Denny's book coming out? What is Denny's what? Book coming out. Oh, <laughs> well, as I retire for the fourth time from city service and service to the mayor, I will begin this book uh, in late October. So stay tuned. Uh, it'll be something uh, a short of a Kitty Kelly tell-all, but it will try to help others uh, who face the same uh, comments. And I did notice one other question, if we have one minute to answer it. Someone said, how can I call myself gay if in fact uh, I have enjoyed my sexual experience? And the quick answer uh, is human sexuality is very complicated. The Kinsey scale we know is very broad. One can be operatively bisexual as I am but find your true home, your true authenticity, where do you feel most comfortable and, and where you want to live. And that's what I've done. So you, one can be operatively bisexual and, and then find exactly what your truest nature is and the one in which you'd like to live authentically the rest of your life. Great, well, once again, I wanna say that most of these, a lot of these questions are, are really not questions. They're accolades for all four of you for uh, your presentation. So uh, on behalf of the attendees, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I would like to thank our presenters today, Christy, Dana, Dane, Linda, and Denny for sharing their stories with us. Um, it's been most enlightening for, for a lot of us, I'm sure. Um, be sure to join us next Friday for Stacy Shelnut Hendrick, the Director of Education at the Crocker Art Museum. We'll be discussing museums as places for object-based learning. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>